Amen. Here I am to worship. You guys remember this one, right? This is one when I got glasses. I thought we'd do it again. <laughs> Amen. genuinely worship you. Amen. And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we bless you. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Thanks. Just as a heads up, if you did not get communion elements, a little cup like this on your way in, there's a few over here. Once they're around, you'll have to go back to the lobby. But if anybody doesn't have them, 
you're going to want them as we get to the end of the service today. Well, we're going to spend some time praying. And, and what I want to pray about, you know, every week we pick something that we want to pray about specifically. And so uh, what, what we're going to pray about specifically today is uh, for God's truth to be embraced by people who don't want to hear about Jesus. And it's based, I, I get to pick that because I, based on some personal experience from the past week and, and sharing the gospel with people that don't really want to hear about the truth of God's word. And so uh, hopefully uh, God's going to just can bring those people in, under conviction. I know that there are people in your own life that are probably the same way. There might be somebody here this morning that kind of came in kind of grudgingly and I don't really want to hear about all this God stuff and about the Bible and those kinds of things. And so we're going to spend some time in silent prayer. And you can pray however you might feel led, whatever burdens you might be carrying this morning. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm going to lead us in a time of praying for the truth of God's Word to be amplified in the hearts and minds of people who have not yet embraced it. And so, uh, and we're, we're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. We'll put the words up on the screen and back to me so we can all follow along. Let's pray together.
Remember Joshua asked them to go back into the, the dry riverbed as God was holding the water back from the river. And they gathered uh, 12 stones, one from each tribe, and they set up a memorial so that God uh, would be glorified in it. And people would ask, the next generation would ask, what do these stones mean to you? And so uh, here we are a little bit uh, later, not a whole lot later, probably a couple days later, uh, when they finally enter into Jericho. Because that's what we were waiting for, isn't it? Uh, Joshua uh, bringing down the walls of Jericho. So our text from this morning, we're going to be a little bit selective in the chapter. We're going to uh, read Joshua chapter 6, for the first five verses. And then we're going to skip ahead to verses 15 through 17. And then we'll fill in a couple of blanks as we uh, go through the message today. Joshua 6, 1 through 5. Now Joshua, I'm oh, sorry, now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand and its, ki its king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Then on the seventh day they rose early in the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city seven days. At the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who were with her in the house shall live. Because she hid the messengers whom we sent. May God grant us this day an understanding of this, His holy word. Amen. So our big idea for today is that the Israelites have been chosen to receive the land occupied by the ungodly Canaanites, not because of their own righteousness, but according to God's purposes. Jericho represents the first step in his reclaiming the land for them. So we're going to look at this story, and, and quite honestly, what we're going to deal with today is one of the more difficult concepts that many of us struggle with uh, in reading our Bibles, and particularly in the Old Testament. And so it's going to be a little bit challenging. And so uh, um, if you bear with us, I'm hoping that we can come to a deeper understanding of God's Word and how it applies in our lives and, and the truth of God's Word. That's what we're praying for. Uh, people to understand the truth of God's Word. And so uh, we'll explain that as we get into the message. And I hope you've got your Bible with you because we're going to do a little bit of page turning fairly early in the message today. We're going to look at three points uh, in our uh, outline if you're taking notes. And the first one that we're going to see is that the city, the city of Jericho, is sealed by God. And so you remember, again, we uh, the, the people in Jericho were well aware that the nation of Israel was coming. You remember how we talked about that when the spies went and talked to Rahab? And Rahab's testimony about, hey, we've heard about this God that you guys have been following out there wandering around. News has gotten back to us. And we've heard about how he parted the Red Sea and about how he provided bread from heaven. And he's worked all these miracles in your midst. And so they knew who, who was coming. Not just the Israelites, not, not just the people, but the God of the Israelites, the God of the Bible, uh, was coming for them as well. And so you can imagine uh, how when, when, the, when the river uh, was stopped up and they came across, remember we said it's like two, maybe two and a half million people. And God stopped up the water for a 20 mile wide stretch and they walked across on dry land. Pretty intimidating circumstances if you were part of the, this city in Jericho. If you were one of the people inside the city, you would have been a little bit frightened, no doubt. But God seals it up. And so notice in the first couple verses here, it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. And God literally used the sons of Israel, the Israelites, to seal up the city. They surrounded the city. You know how a siege works. 
And so they would surround the city, and the city would have been dependent on the, the fruits of the fields, you know, the farm country outside the city walls. And if they couldn't go out there and get food and supplies and things like that, bring them back into the city, not, it wouldn't take too long for them to run out of food. And that was, not a, that was a, a very common military strategy. You surround the city, don't let anybody in or out, and sooner or later they're, they're going to either starve to death or they're going to get to the point where they're going to surrender and give up anyway. And so uh, that still actually happens in, in modern warfare. You cut off the supply chain, and then uh, sooner or later, they're going to either give up or they're going to die from a, a lack of uh, food and supplies. And so it says, because of the sons of Israel. So God used the sons of Israel. Now, it, it, it might sound in that first verse like they're getting a little bit of credit for it. Man, they did a pretty good job. Well, it's not necessarily, because read the second verse. He says, the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, and it's king and it's valiant warriors. So they might have been thinking they were doing a pretty good job. And they're doing everything that they've been trained to from a military perspective. And, and they're going to overthrow the city, and God had called them to do that. But what they did was they sealed it up tight so nobody could get in or out. And I really like the way that the, that second verse reads. And, and, and we're all really glad that I'm not God, amen? Uh, so, because if I, if, if I were speaking that verse to, to the Israelites, I would have said, see? <laughs> Little inflection there. Because I, I don't think that's really what God said. He said, see? Like kind of matter-of-factly. Sometimes God speaks kind of matter-of-factly to me. I don't know about to you. But he speaks kind of matter-of-factly to me. See, I, I've, I've given the nation into your hand, the king and all his valiant warriors. And this is the same king that had been looking for Rahab, remember, and, and uh, chasing her around. And that's why she had to be held safe from that. So God says, I am the one who has delivered the nation into, your, into the city into your hand. But he's using the people, his people, to accomplish his will in this case. It says, and then he, he's kind of prescriptive about it. He said, you shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. And you shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets. Now, if, if you've got your Bible in your hand, and your uh, pen in your hand, I want you to circle or underline the word seven, or seven. Every time we see that, we're going to see it a bunch of times. And so you want to uh, underline or circle the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when, when they make a long blast with the ram torn, and you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Now, this, this book in Joshua and a lot of Old Testament books, you'll hear the same language repeated numerous times. You ever read through a whole book of the Old Testament? And you say, because what, what happens often uh, somebody will receive a, a word from the Lord, whether it's Moses or here at Joshua, and he says, here's what I want you to tell the people. And then he goes and he tells the people, and then they do what it, he told them to do. And so they'll say, he said, I want you to go. And then he says, hey, God says we're going to go. And then they go. See how that, see how that works? So it, you'll, you'll see it happen numerous times, for, like usually three times, repeatedly. So we see the same thing here in the text from this morning. I want you to, here's what I want you to do. I want you to march around the city once a day for six days. We're with that so far? We're, we're okay? And then on the seventh day, you're going to march around it seven times. And then blow the trumpet. Everybody's going to shout really loud, and the walls will fall down. But God is the one that sealed the city up, ultimately. It's, it's really because of God's authority, God's holiness, that the, 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 the city is sealed up. And when Rahab talked to the spies, you remember that? When Rahab talked to the spies and, he, and, and talked about the reputation that the God of the nation of Israel had amongst the people of Jericho. When she said, we've heard about this God and the things that he's done. And so she said, you know, we're basically, we're a little freaked out because we know what this God is capable of. The God that you're following. You remember, she talked about that our hearts have melted. And that's... That's kind of, we, we just, we, we're going to, we gave up. We're, we're so discouraged because we have heard about this powerful God. We, we've got our own false gods, but not a whole lot seems to be happening with them.
But ultimately, it's God that shut the door. Now, the city of Jericho is inhabited by ungodly people. And I started thinking this week, uh, as I was putting this together, I started thinking about that God's the one that sealed the door. And, and so what do you think about when God closes doors? I mean, uh, God closed another door. Do you remember there was another door in, in Genesis chapter 6 that was closed by God? Or Genesis 7, excuse me, Genesis 7, well, it started. So anyway, so in, uh, in Genesis 7, 15, and those who entered, male and female, all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And so it's the ark, right? And so God uh, led Mo uh, Noah and all his, the, the animals and his family into the ark. And then the Bible tells us that he's the one that sealed the door. He closed the door behind them as they entered into the ark. Because what we're dealing with, honestly, is one of the more difficult concepts in Scripture. I, I talked about at the beginning and the big idea how uh, Jericho is the first city to fall to the Canaanites. And if you've ever read the book of Joshua, you know it's like one after the other after the other. There's a, there's a lot of bloodshed. There's a lot of military stuff happening here in, in the book of Joshua as they overthrow the inhabitants of Canaan. And this is one of the most difficult concepts that people deal with in Scripture. And, and I've heard people numerous times, and I guess the Old Testament just makes me uncomfortable. There's so many people dying and all this violence, and I'm really not comfortable. Can we get to the part where it says God is love? I mean, that's a whole lot more easy for me to deal with. And not too long ago, I was trying to think, it's, it, I think it was December, I sat down with uh, somebody who asked a question that maybe some of us this morning have on our own minds, or maybe somebody that we know has on our own mind. And, and the question is asked is, why would God kill or order the destruction of so many innocent people? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever heard somebody else ask that question? Yes. And so we need to address that question. I mean, honestly, if we're, if we're going to... If we're going to say, like, we believe that this is the inspired word of God, we can't skip over this stuff and say, let's get to the part that feels nice. So we need to understand it. Now, the person that asked me that same question had, uh, had a child and, and said, you know, I, I can't, there's no way I can worship a God that would do this kind of thing. So therefore, the conclusion that I'm drawing is that this book is not true. And if it were, I would never worship a God who would do such a thing. Now, this is a common objection that a lot of people will have, and I think we need to address it. And so that's why we're going to spend just a little bit of time this morning addressing this concept. Why would God order the destruction of so many innocent people? Now, I made an allusion to, to uh, Noah just a little while ago. And so I always think it's kind of hysterical that Noah is... Uh, uh, is a, a child's toy or, or wallpaper in a nursery and stuff like that. Ultimately, the book Noah's uh, The Flood story is not child-friendly, right? I mean, it, it would be at least PG-13 if you were to genuinely tell that story because it involves the destruction of almost every living thing on the face of the earth. It's not a zoo story. But so let's take a look at what the Bible actually teaches about this, the destruction of the Canaanites and why it would become necessary. And I, I want to use that word. It's necessary. And so in, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, I want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20. And... I'm sorry. I'm going to put that up on the screen. We're not, we don't have to turn to that. We're going to turn it to another chapter in just a second. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 16 and 17, it says, Only the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes, but you shall utterly destroy them. Okay, so this is God speaking to Moses. You, you, you're going to, you have to destroy every, every living thing. So now I want to turn uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, because we need to understand why would God do such a thing? And in Deuteronomy 
chapter 7. I'm going to read the first four verses. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it. So this is when, this is when God is speaking to Moses. But when the people of the nation of Israel enter into the promised land. When you enter into the land that you shall possess as an inheritance, the one that he promised to Abraham. That's what we're talking about now. Jericho is the first domino, essentially, that is going to fall. He says, uh, when you enter in, when, you, when I bring you into the land, that you're entering to possess it, and, and I, I clear away many of the nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, Seven nations greater and stronger than you, and the Lord your God delivers them before you, and you shall defeat them. You shall utterly destroy them. Utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them, and you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. And verse 4 for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Because see, if, if they're still there, you guys are going to start mixing with them, and it's going to lead you away from worshiping the true God. And God says, that's not going to happen to my people. So let's take a look now at Numbers 33. <laughs> Numbers chapter 33. And verse 55 and 56. Numbers 33, 55 and 56. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. And as I plan to do the, to them, I will do to you. Consequences. And then one more. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 14. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. Now, passing through the fire is most likely a reference to a pagan ritual that, that the people of this nation uh, participated in, and it's the worship of a false god named Molech. And if you're not familiar with Molech, uh, they made uh, metal, iron statues of him with his hands out, and they would heat it up with fire to the point that it was red hot, and they would put their children into this statue's hands and destroy them as an offering to this false god. And so he says, I, don't, I, don't want, I want to make sure that you don't participate in the sacrifice of your children. I had an interesting thing. I was listening to Sports Talk Radio this week, um, and I, not that I'm recommending that, but one of, one of the, the commentators on, on this uh, talk program uh, had apparently bought three eggs. You can, uh, you can buy fertilized eggs and incubators, and I, I'm guessing they were ducks. I don't honestly know for sure because I didn't hear the very beginning of it, but let's just say they were ducks. And he said, so uh, we got these three eggs and you have to take care of the humidity and the temperature and make sure that everything's cared for just right. And since you bought fertilized eggs, they'll hatch into baby ducklings and everybody oohs and ahs, right? Like little fuzzy pink ducklings, or not pink, hopefully <laughs> yellow. Ducking, ducks, that'd be kind of cool. But anyway, so there's these little ducks wandering around, and, um, but only two of the three hatched. And so this guy and his daughter were a little bit concerned. It's, oh, man, what happened to the third one? It's, well, maybe it wasn't fertilized, you know, and, or something went wrong. So they cracked it open, and they said that, sadly, there was a duck in it. And, but it, 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 it died. You know, it, it, didn't, it wasn't, didn't survive. And I said, so you're telling me, while it was still in the egg, it was a duck. But then people will say, well, 
while it's still in the womb, it, it's not a baby. So see, see the, how we apply the criteria unevenly? It's a duck before it hatches from the egg, but it's not a baby until after it's born. There, there's an absurdity to that, folks. I, I, I got to tell you, we, we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear the truth of God's word. We do? You sure? Even though it's hard? Okay. So anyway, that, he, he's telling you, I, make sure... That, that you don't make your children pass through the, the fire. Or anyone who practices witchcraft, or who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist. Christians should not be reading their horoscopes or go getting their fortunes told. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you hear from a spirit in those circumstances, I can tell you it's not the spirit of God. That's right. And so he's telling his, his people, I want to make sure you stay pure. So don't participate in these things. And wh whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out. The people, the inhabitants of Canaan, they are practicing these things in the land of Canaan and in Jericho. I'm going to drive them out. But you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations, nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. So, the people that are in, uh, in the way, sort of, of, of the nation of Israel are practicing these things. And in Leviticus 18, verse 24, we, we read, Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. And, and so just for context, any of these things, Leviticus 18 is all about sexual immorality and sexual sin. You say, don't defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. They have become defiled by practicing these, things, these ungodly things. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it. Because, church, we, we need to understand something. When we read in our Old Testament, you know, we, we talked about how uh, so there's pictures of what's coming in, in the person of Christ. When, when the gospel is, is being... Uh, fine-tuned, sort of, as we read from the beginning of the book to the, to the later parts of the book. Coexist bumper stickers are really popular. And, and we, we have this idea that, that every religion in the world should be able to cooperate, and, and people tell me one of the more ridiculous things. I had this conversation on uh, Thursday night. Um, with my brother-in-law, that they think that every religion is leading to God. Right? That's what Oprah tells us. Do we get our theology from Oprah Church? I, I hope not, right? So, but Oprah says that all religions are the same, and, and they're all leading in the same, same direction. We might be taking a different path, but we're all heading the same direction, and Oprah's completely wrong right. in that. Because, the, the, now... As Christians, as believers, we're supposed to be Christ-like towards other people. And I get that condemnation of other people. We're not talking about that. But what we're talking about is that, that truth and lies cannot coexist. And, and, and righteousness and unrighteousness cannot coexist. And, and godliness and ungodliness cannot coexist. It says in Revelation chapter 1 that no, 21, it says that no sin shall enter into heaven. Right? So sin cannot exist in God's presence. Amen? You remember back to when they were carrying the ark and they, they picked up the ark. Remember they couldn't touch the ark? In fact, they said you got to stay at least a thousand yards away from it. Because God's holiness will obliterate you because of your sinfulness. You can't actually be in the presence of God unless you are completely sinless. And so these people that are inhabiting God's territory are not qualified to inhabit that space. They are deeply sinful, and they have been warned for 400 years. 
God brought the exodus about because he said, he didn't bring the exodus about for a while because he said the sin of the Canaanites has not gotten to that point yet. But when he brought the nation out of Israel, or, or out of uh, Egypt, and brought them back into the nation of Israel, it was because their sin had reached to the point where it was no longer tolerable to God. So, so when, when we go to heaven, we're not taking our sin with us, Jerry. Just, just so we're clear of that, right? Because who took our sin for us? Jesus. Thank you. you. You can't take your sin to heaven. It, it can't exist. It's like trying to put metal into an MRI machine. Like the, you, you can't, it can't exist in that same space. And so when, when the nation comes back into Canaan, into the promised land, it's about 500 years before they build the temple. And the temple, in a lot of ways, is God's house. It invites God's presence into the land. You know, it's got, it's got household implements in it. It's got chairs, tables, food, candelabras, all, all that kind of stuff. It's the place where God is supposed to dwell on the face of the earth. Now, at this point, in Joshua's terms, he's, he's in the ark, kind of. Like, not, okay, not literally, right? But so his, his presence is made manifest on the earth in the ark. And so they, they got to clean up things a little bit before God's house can be built in the nation of Israel. So, that question, how could God order the destruction of innocent people? Is answered, biblically, he wouldn't. And he never had. That's right. Who knows what Romans 3.23 says? All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So there are no innocent people. That's right. Right? And so he, he, he's not saying, you know what, just because somebody's friendly and they get up and go to work every day and they're trying to raise their family does not mean that they are sinless. That's true of us, too, isn't it, church? That's right. And so, he, he, in fact, in Genesis chapter 6, this is right before the flood, in Genesis chapter 6, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he brought the flood. And so when, when, in a smaller fashion, when he looks into the nation of Israel, and it's time for the Israelites to re-enter, he's looking at the inhabitants of that, of that nation the same way. Of, of each one of these city-states, he's looking at them, and the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. And for God to repossess that land, and for God's people to repossess that land, they had to be gone, or they would influence God's people for evil. And so I answer that question again. It, it, why would God order the destruction of innocent people? He wouldn't. All right. Amen. And so the same person that asked me that question um, looked at that and, and compared themselves to, to uh, the world, no doubt, and said that, you know, I, I'm a good person and my next door neighbor, they're not Christian, but they're, not, they're not good, nice people. I mean, they're really friendly and they've got kids and, and you know they have good jobs and they're going about life and, and so they're good people and when I look at the Bible and it says that you got to go kill all these people there were people just like my neighbors and us in, involved in that no doubt that there were people in Jericho that went up, got up and went to work every day they might even have given money to good causes but they weren't good people That's right. they had been stained by sin and so this woman drew the conclusion that because I can't comprehend how that could possibly be the case, this book, in its entirety, must be false. I could never worship a God who would do such a thing. Because I would never do such a thing. Well, if, if we are tempted to draw that kind of a conclusion that I could never worship a God that, that wouldn't do what I wouldn't do or would do something that I wouldn't do, then what we're effectively saying is that I'm God. 
I, I get to decide what's, what's true and what's not true and what's good and what's not good and what's righteous and what's not righteous. Or are we going to allow God to be God? Does God have the right to do that kind of a thing? He certainly does. He created it all in the first place to his own glory. He didn't cleanse once. He cleansed numerous times. The flood came and, and destroyed every living thing except those that were on the ark. And so the, the same thing happens here. God enters in and, and says, you know what? The, the, the sin that is in this place must be dealt with. And it's going to be a significant act to deal with it. So I, I want to share with you a quote that I got from a guy named uh, T Tremper Logman. Some of you may have read some of his commentaries. And he says, the war against the Canaanites was simply an earlier phase of the battle that comes to its climax on the cross and its completion at the final judgment. The object of warfare moves from the Canaanites, who are the object of God's wrath for their sin, to the spiritual powers and principalities, and then finally to the utter destruction of all evil human, all evil, human and spiritual. Evil and sin has to be dealt with. And it, and it can't be just ignored or swept under the carpet or, or uh, kind of put to the side. It has to be destroyed. And so when Jesus went to the cross, for those of us who have put our trust in him or who are saved, who are born again, he destroyed our sin. And so that we are cleansed through faith in him. But remember, sin and holiness cannot coexist in the same place. So, not only was the city sealed by God, the, the city was really, it was, it was delivered by God. And so, I, I want to uh, jump ahead now to uh, verse 15. And if you're marking in your Bible, look at verse 13, there's a couple sevens in there, you're going to want to mark. And, and then uh, down to 15 it says, uh, on the seventh day, they arose early in the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Now, the reason I ask you to mark how many sevens there are, because this is basic Bible study. If you're reading your Bible and maybe you're having a hard time understanding it, you want to get better at understanding it, when there's a word repeated multiple times, what does that tell us? It, it might be important, right? And so, so maybe we ought to pay attention to that. God's not into redundancy. He doesn't just use the same word numerous times for no reason. And so he's calling our attention to it. And it says, so I want you to, to march around the city seven times. So on the seventh day, they got up and they, did, and they marched around the city seven times. And it was only that day that they marched around the city seven times. Another seven. And at the seventh time, another seven, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the, the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. In verse 17, The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom he sent. Now if I were part of the nation of Israel... And you keep hearing about how sinful the Canaanites are. I feel start, start feeling pretty good about myself. Anybody with me? You don't want to admit it, I know, because we're in church. But uh, when you're on the way home, you can stop. Yeah, I, I probably would too. But so seriously, we'd say like, man, those guys are so bad. So there's a comparison going on here, right? And we start to think, man, these guys are a complete mess, <laughs> right? And and God's going to deliver them over, and and we think, man, I, we we're, God likes us best. <laughs> Right? I mean, seriously, we, we would think that way, wouldn't we? But God reminds the nation of Israel, but it's not because it's like our big idea. It, it's not that they're so good. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5, it says, It is not for your righteousness, this is God speaking to the nation of Israel, or for the uprightness of your heart that you're, you're going to possess the land, but it's because of the wickedness of those nations that the, war, the Lord your God is driving them out. They are so evil that I'm going to drive them out, and I'm going to work in you to my own glory. It's, it's not that you're so good. You didn't earn this thing, okay? And so sometimes as Christians, you know, we get saved, we get born again, our sins are forgiven, praise the Lord. I get to go to heaven when, you, when I die, and you don't. 
There's an effective evangelism strategy, huh? But, but seriously, by comparison, we look at the people around us. I mean, like, I, you know, I mentioned a little while ago, I'm, I'm pro-life. I can look at somebody that, that's uh, pro-abortion and say, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow morally superior to you. Uh-uh, I, don't, I don't believe that for a second. Not because anything that I've done is because of what Jesus has done, right? And so when, when it's, it's God's righteousness, it's the imputation of God's righteousness on his people when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we're supposed to live according to the standards of God. We can try and do that as well as we possibly can, but we're never going to do it perfectly. But we're never going to earn God's favor by being good. We're never going to earn our way into heaven by following the law. The Bible is really clear about that. I mean, if you're not really clear about that, let's talk about how clear that is in Scripture, because it's ample, amply evident to anybody that reads the New Testament that like, you, you can't possibly be good enough. But he says that they're going to be under the ban. And so the ban is, is a weird word to use there. Because God has banned certain things. Not all that, you know, getting your horoscope read and all that kind of stuff. But he, well, he has that. But, but that's not what we're talking about here. There's actually a word uh, in Hebrew that's translated here, ban, called harem. Everybody say harem. Anybody else get spit on the back of their head when somebody <laughs> said that? It's a little bit like trying to get somebody's attention. You know, when somebody's talking, you go, ahem. Maybe not quite that phlegmatically, you know what I mean? So, uh, but uh, harem is, is the word that's translated here uh, to the band. But it means devoted things, the things that are devoted to God. And so he tells them that uh, it's okay to go ahead and collect the gold and the silver and those things that we're going to... Remember, remember, the temple hasn't been built yet, and, and we're going to use it into God's treasury and building, building the temple implements to glorify God and all that whole process. But he says that uh, it, the ban also it means that you're not supposed to take anything else. Because, you know, it would have been normal practice to, uh, to collect as much booty as you possibly could. Like, like, hey, you walk into a city, and there's, there's like stuff laying around. Hey, let's grab it. My dad actually talked about that. My, you know, my dad uh, served in World War II, and he was on uh, Okinawa. Uh, and so uh, he, he told me a story about how uh, they entered into a house um, and it had been burned out, and some of the guys found these bags of coins, like big bags of coins. Um, and so they grabbed them, right? And so they started carrying them. But they're also, I mean, he was in a, a mortar division. They got all their battle gear on, all that kind of stuff. Pretty hot. Somebody's trying to kill you. That's all, you know, that part of it, right? And so they're carrying these bags of coins. And he said he's, he's marching, they're marching along this trail. And he started seeing bags of coins. And, and piles of coins. Because guys had pockets full of them. And they're like, you know, th this isn't worth it. So they just started ditching them. He brought one home. I actually have it. It's kind of cool, but... The same is true of the stuff that we try to carry sometimes. It's not worth it. You know, the, the weight of trying to take something that, that God doesn't have for us and trying to carry it, 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 it is not worth the hindrance that it is to our walk with him. All right. And so he tells the nation, like, you're not going to take all this stuff that you could possibly get as, as normally would be the practice. So, you're only going to take the stuff that's going to glorify God. And that's the way we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to be free of the, the burdens of the world and walk in a way that uh, it, it allows us to glorify God. All right. so he, he's told them, I, I want you to do all this stuff, right? And I want you to make sure that you, that, that, um, you march around the city and you blow the trumpets. And when, when you hear the trumpets blow, then everybody's going to shout, and the walls are going to fall down. And then uh, I'm going to share with you Joshua 6.20. So this is in the same chapter that we're in. We'll put it up on the screen, though. It says, so the people shouted, and the priests blew the, the trumpets, and the people heard the sound of the trumpets, and the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. So God said, here's what you're going to tell the people. Joshua tells the people, here's what we're going to do, and then they do it. All right. And the walls fall down flat. It actually, it, if you translate that directly, it, it says that they fell down upon themselves. So, 
in your mind's eye, think World Trade Center, straight down, right? It didn't, the wall didn't fall over. If they'd been using battering rams and stuff like that to knock them over, they would have knocked them into the city. And so that, that's not what happened. They fell down flat, straight down. And there is archaeological evidence or proof that that's actually what happened because the city of Jericho has been unearthed. And guess what? The walls are just piled up right on top of each other. They're not knocked over to the side. They came straight down. And I think it's a little bit interesting here that they, remember they've been told for seven days to march around the city. They're marching around the city. They're marching around the city. And so, you know, for the first six days, if I were part of the nation, uh, of the city of Jericho, and, you know, no doubt they had uh, observers on the walls watching what's going on. because They're kind of waiting for this thing to come, right? And so they're probably watching them, and they walk around the city. Like, uh, like you see, if you're, the, if you're the guy at the lookout on top of the wall, and you see all the soldiers get up and put all their battle gear on, you're thinking, uh-oh, here we go, right? And so they walk around the city, and then they take it all back off and sit down again. I go like, maybe it's not going to be so bad. You know, maybe that reckoning is not really going to come. Because all they do is kind of walk around. They make a little bit of noise, and, and then nothing never seems to change until the seventh day. And so what does seven mean? And biblically, like you guys are churched, right? So it means sometimes we call it the number of perfection or number of completion. completion. And that's why there's so many sevens here. Because the work of God in the city of Jericho wasn't completed until the seventh time that they went around the city. And then they, they blew the trumpet seven times. Seven priests blew seven trumpets seven times. And guess what happened? It, that, that work is complete and the walls come straight down. And I think it's kind of interesting that they've been walking around the city, walking around the city and around the city and around the city day after day. They get up and they go around the city. But once the walls come down, it says they went straight ahead. No more going in circles. You ever feel like you're going in circles sometimes in life? And like, man, I do it. Keep walking around the city. And nothing seems to change That's right. until God steps in. And he says, I want you to go straight ahead. Amen. And so that's, that's, that's what happened to the nation here. The walls come down. The barrier between them and, and the work that God had for them to do was removed. Straight down. And they went straight ahead and went about what God had called them to do. And so there's archaeological evidence. In fact, there's a statement this came from the Daily Press. It says, when we compare the archaeological evidence of Jericho with the biblical narrative describing the Israelite destruction of Jericho, we find remarkable agreement. Imagine that. An archaeological discovery that verifies what God told us all along. You can see that the city was burned. You can tell the, the siege wasn't very long because there were still food stores. They hadn't even used up all their food yet. They didn't have to starve them out because God had something different in mind. In fact, we're going to talk. About, we're not going to go into every city. I mean, I, I, this is the beginning of this process, and, and Joshua and his army go from place to place to place. And so this whole concept of, of the destruction of so-called innocent people, according to some people's estimation, they're all just as polluted by sin as the, as the people of Jericho. There's evidence that at this time, 1500-ish BC, that a whole bunch of cities were destroyed in a very short period of time. Isn't that shocking? So all those people that are saying, like, I don't, this, this probably never, I don't believe Joshua ever even existed. Well, guess what? The evidence says otherwise. And so um, the last point that we're going to look at today is, uh, is Rahab was defended by God. And so we didn't look at this uh, part of the text yet, but I'm going to jump down to um, verse 22. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Remember the two spies that Rahab talked to? Uh, she, he goes and he talks to the two spies, and he says, go to the harlot's house. I mean, not, he's not even calling her by her name here, right? Go to the harlot's house. Remember we talked about her reputation? That she's, uh, she's known by her vocation. And Go to the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. Keep your promise. Keep the promise that, that we've made as a people. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. And they also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. 
And it says, they burned the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And however, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all that she had, Joshua was spared. And as we said, she lived in the nation of Israel. She was adopted into the nation of Israel, adopted into God's people because she had faith that the rest of the city of Jericho didn't have. And so, not only did, did God's people keep their promise that they made to her. Remember, they struck a, she struck a deal with them. She said, I'll help you out. But I know this God that you trust and that you're following is the real God. And so it, it says that they burned the city and all that was in it, except Rahab and her family. So they brought fire into the city and destroyed everything except Rahab and her family. Back in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, God brought water and destroyed everyone except Noah and his family. They were spared, but everybody else was not. And so in, in this case, the inhabitants of this culture, the culture that we've described, that the Bible, and we didn't do all of it, believe me, that the Bible describes really as, as deeply sinful and, and destroying their children and practicing uh, black arts or dark arts and, and, and doing all these kinds of things, God destroyed, except for the ones who put their trust in him by fire. But we got to be aware, church, that there are a lot of people who are not going to agree with this word. That's why we prayed about that specifically this morning. That's right. Amen. And so, in Jude, chapter 1, New Testament, in Jude, chapter 1, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. <laughs> And have mercy on some who are doubting. I, I love that. Have, have mercy on some who are doubting. And I don't doubt for a second that there are people here this morning who are doubting. And there are people that are watching on our live stream or our YouTube channel and, and that are doubting. And they're still struggling with that question. I can't reconcile God's love that I really like and I can really embrace with the wrath of God and the destruction of people that look just like me. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And so when, when we share our faith with other people, that's our desire, right? Is to snatch them out of the fire, the destruction that is coming because of sin, right? And so, so a fiery destruction came to the nation or to the city of Jericho because of their sin. And that's the promise that God has made us, that, that because of our own sin, that what we deserve, what we have earned, is eternity in hell. And a fire that never goes out. And what we deserve. But when we recognize that God's righteousness is imputed to us through our faith in Jesus Christ, then we don't get what we deserve. We can be like Rahab and be saved from the fire. And so that ought to be our desire. When, when we're sharing our faith, you know, we talk about personal evangelism and outreach and Bill's working on the pray and go thing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, as soon as I say, you know, you go share the gospel with somebody, I know 95% of us right away clench up just a little bit. Ugh. I, I can't do that. I, 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 no, 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 I, not, not me. Like somebody. I, but are we willing to try and snatch them out of the fire? Right. Okay, so that, that's what we're talking about. Right. We, we need to understand the consequences and the circumstances that we are in. The guy, there's a guy that's working on the building here that says he believes in Odin, which is a 
pagan god from Europe from a long time ago. He's an Odinite, he said. I don't recommend you look that up, by the way. I think he's just trying to be clever. But he doesn't have an answer to the questions that I asked him. And so I shared with him the gospel. I unloaded the toolbox on him, this guy. But not, not so that I can say, oh, look what, look what a good thing I did. Because that, if that guy dies, if he falls off the cherry picker, he, he doesn't know Christ. He, he's going to be one of those inhabitants of Jericho that will be destroyed by the righteousness of God when he enters in. When Jesus comes back again, the walls will fall straight down upon themselves. And he will enter straight in. And there will be an account that we each have to make. So, let's see if we can't snatch some people out of the fire. I mean, that, that's really what I want. People ask me, again, talking to my brother-in-law Thursday night, and I said, you know what, the only thing I really care about, I mean, we talked about it a little bit last week, about our kids, right? The only thing I really care about is that I get to go to heaven when I die. I want to take as many people as I possibly can with me. I'm hoping that's everybody in this room. But that's up to you. It's not up to me. It's up to you to put your personal trust in Jesus Christ. Because for sure the walls are going to fall down. And the army's coming. You want to be like Rahab and be protected from the fire. You want to be like Noah, the ones that are sealed inside the ark. Or do you want to be like the inhabitants of Jericho? I mean, my prayer for every, every one of us is we say, you know what, I'm in. I want to put my trust in Jesus Christ. I, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. That's my prayer for every single one of us. That's whether you're in the room right now or whether you're watching online. Because we, we read out in, uh, in 1 John chapter 5, it says the testimony is this. That God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who knows the Son has life. Okay, that's, that's, that's the good part. And so a lot of Christians say, like, oh, that's praise the Lord. I mean, that deserves to praise the Lord, doesn't it? That's right. But there's another side to that same point. Right. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you have eternal life. But the Scripture teaches us really clear. This is not ambiguous language. This is not part of the Bible where we go, I don't think I can understand what that means. Okay, let's be really clear about it. It says, he who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. See, that's the other side of the same coin. I don't want that for anybody. I don't want that for the guy that comes to the other night. I don't want that for my brother-in-law and my sister. I don't want that for anybody that's here this morning. That's right. So if you don't yet know Christ as your Savior and Lord, my temptation is always to beg people. I'll be honest with you. Because I, I get kind of desperate about it. But I'm not going to beg you. It's right there in front of you. And all you have to do today is to say yes to Jesus. All right. Turn away from your sin, you turn to him and you ask him to forgive your sins and you become a Christian. I mean, that's really what it means to become a Christian. So there's a, a, a apologist named Frank Turek who you know, people say, I don't, I don't believe this book. I can never believe in this God. It can't be true because I don't understand it. And I, like I tell you all the time, I could give you a, a book on nuclear physics and you would say, I can't understand this. But you would never once tell me it's not true just because you can't understand it. That's an absurdity. And so I don't always understand what God, why God does what he does. I don't know anybody who does except him. I'm not God. I don't get to decide. He does. So turn away from your sin. Turn to him and say, well, Lord, I, I can't possibly do this on my own. But Frank Turek asks people all the time. They, they want to come up with all sorts of object, objections, like this guy Greg that I talked to on Wednesday. But he says, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And so that's a question that I've got for each of us. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? 
And there's a lot of people that would answer that question, no. Because I don't want this whole Jesus thing. I don't want the changes that it's going might require of me. I don't want the sense of guilt that I might feel because of all the things that I've done. I don't want to give up the friend that God said that I shouldn't hang around anymore. I don't want to give up my sin because I love it so much. Essentially what you're saying is I love my sin more than I love Jesus. And again, that's up to you. It's not up to me. And I'm not going to beg you. I'm just going to tell you. Let today be the day of salvation. Turn to Christ. Ask him for his forgiveness forgiveness, for his forgiveness. Put your trust in him today. Be saved. Be born again. And do it now. So Lord God, we thank you for the privilege we've had to be in your word this morning and for all that you've done in our hearts and minds, Lord. Praise you, we bless you. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to come to the table now. Again, if you, hopefully you have a communion elements like this, and we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes. But um, if you've got elements like this, you're going to want to peel off that clear, uh, clear uh, top part and get out the wafer. If you're not aware, if you haven't been with us for communion before, we have what's called an open communion, which means you don't have to be a member here. But if you're trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation, then you're more than welcome to join us at his table. So this is one of two sacraments that we celebrate in the Evangelical Congregational Church. So, what happened before Jesus went to the cross? Remember we talked about last week about memorials. It was called memorial stones. Anybody remember that? One, two, three, four hands. Great. Um, but there are inanimate memorials. And then there are animated memorials. Living memorials. And so this is one of the living memorials memorial that we rehearse to remember what God has done. Just like when the nation of Israel was told to remember the, the Passover, the Seder dinner as a living memorial to God's grace. So, take out that little wafer and um, we're going to eat it all together after I say what we call the words of institution. So what happened at the Last Supper, the night before Jesus went to the cross, was he had his disciples in the upper room and he took a piece of bread and he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples after he had given thanks for it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to take it and eat it. Do this remembering me. And then carefully remove the second layer to reveal the cup. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. And as often as you would drink of it, do so remembering me. Amen. Lord God, we are just so blessed that you made a way for us to be reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of his body on the cross on our behalf. He bore the sins that we each have incurred so that through faith in him we could be born again to a new life in Christ and be saved from the consequences of our own sin. And like Rahab and her family and like Noah and his family, we could be saved from the destruction that is due us because of our sin. So Lord, in it all, we celebrate your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Thank our pastor for showing us how the Old Testament and the New Testament walk together. Sealed by God, 
delivered by God, defended by God. Now, I was raised in, uh, put it in a box, what you would call Black Baptist fundamentals. Black being the experience, the culture, um, Baptist being the tenets, and um, fundamentalists being the, the heart of it. They, they like uh, sincerity of, of details of, of God's word. And one of the things it, it did for me as a young fella, they, they encouraged me when, when you sing God's words, when you read God's words to, to mean it. And so, um, any of you ever sung that word, that song, uh, I Surrender All, I Surrender All? I remember times I, I just would not, I'd sing all the other parts and get to that part right there. I wouldn't sing it. Everybody else would be singing it. And because I knew what I was doing or where I was at or whatever was going on, and I wouldn't sing it. And, um, and so I want to encourage you, uh, as we sing this particular hymn, we're going to do a hymn, it's, Amazing Grace, as we sing that one, I want to encourage you to keep in mind the last verse. This one's one of my favorites. And it says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. And so, after we sing that, we're going to do four verses of it, of the, of the hymn. And after we sing that, we're going to just take the last moment and praise God in the, in the melody of the song. Okay, and you'll get it as we go along. All right? So let us stand and sing Amazing Grace.
start now and praise you. Praise God. 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 Amen. Before the pastor closes us out, I'd just like to thank you. You guys are awesome. Can you put up the check-in slide again, please? Uh, just real quick, I want to remind everybody to check in on Facebook if you haven't already done that. The hashtag for the month of August is Bricks for Schools. Bricks, the number four, schools. And every check-in goes towards contributing bricks to build schools for needy children in Senegal. So I want to encourage you to be part of that. There's lots going on. I would really encourage everybody to get on the, uh, the electronic bulletin, which comes on Saturday morning once you're registered for it. Just go to trinitylighthouse.org and uh, follow the links to sign up for the online bulletin. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And as of this moment, I am on vacation for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs>